Muhammad Al Jibali. The best of words or the best speech are the words of Allah. The best of guidance is the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet's mission Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it is to explain the Quran to us and to teach us how to practice it, how to live by it. His manner, his character was basically the Quran. So he is advising his companions that after me be careful, don't fight for power, keep the word of the Ummah together. And this is part of the teachings of Islam. True Muslims who follow the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and who stay with the Jama'ah of Muslims. We can secure our place in Jannah if we only follow the first word that the Prophet وسلم, said in his advice. So he is advising his companions that after me be careful, don't fight for power. Allah's way is the Sunnah of his Prophet. Alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu. Indeed, praise is to Allah. We praise Him and ask Him for forgiveness and seek His help. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. And we seek shelter with Allah from the evils of ourselves and our deeds. Man yahdihi Allahu fala mudilla lah. Whoever Allah guides, no one can misguide. And whoever He misguides, no one can guide. If you have a question about this statement, that many people change its translation and say whoever chooses to be misguided, then there is no one guides him. Actually, this is the precise translation. Whoever Allah misguides, no one can guide. If you want to understand this, you have to understand the full subject of Qadr that I touched upon yesterday, but I have answered to this specific question in my discussion of Qadr that you, inshallah, can later refer to. وَمَا يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ I bear witness that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah alone without partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his prophet and messenger. Indeed, the best of speech is Allah's book. وَخَيْرَ الْهَدْيِ هَدْيُ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمٍ And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا And the worst of affairs are those innovated by people. فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ Every such innovated matter in religion 
is a misguidance that deserves punishment in the hellfire. These last words are something that the Prophet ﷺ used to say often and regularly in his speeches. As is reported by Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu an, that the Prophet Wasallam, when he gave a speech, he used to say these words with anger, with strong emotion. Why? Because they establish the foundation of the deen. Indeed, the best of words or the best speech are the words of Allah. So this establishes that all our guidance emanates issues from Allah's book. And then following that, the best of guidance is the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this tells us that we take our religion from the book of Allah, but we take it with the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which means that the book of Allah by itself independently is not enough for us to understand our religion. We need the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us this actually in his book by his saying, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And we have revealed to you the dhikr, the reminder, the book, so that you would clarify to the people that which has been sent down for them. So the Prophet's mission, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was not, as some people may think, to just deliver the Qur'an to us. But the Prophet's mission is much more than that. It is to explain the Qur'an to us and to teach us, in addition to its meanings, how to practice it, how to live by it, as he did, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha radiallahu anha said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ Quran. His manner, his character was basically the Qur'an. It was an interpretation and a reflection of the Qur'an. And Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرُ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا You have in Allah's Messenger a great example for those who seek, who have hope in the good that comes from Allah and the last day. So the mission of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was and is to tell us about Allah's book, how to practice it, how to live by it, how to follow it how to adhere to it correctly. And this is the way of the Prophet Muhammad A more sophisticated word for way is methodology. So when, the, when you see the word methodology, don't get confused or scared away because it basically means way. So when we say the methodology of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, what we really mean is the way of the true Muslims. That's what it means. The true Muslims who follow the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and who stay with the Jama'ah of Muslims. That's what it means. 
in simple terms. Al Arbad bin Sariya, radiallahu an, one of the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said that once the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam gave them gave the Sahaba a very moving speech. It was so moving that their hearts trembled. They became scared. Scared of what? Scared, of course, of the punishment for those who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Scared that they may not be doing enough to deserve to enter Jannah. But as for us, we do not have to worry because we are doing more than enough, right? Wrong. So, their hearts wajilat, were scared. وَذَرَفَتْ مِنْهَا الْعُيُونَ And their eyes shed tears. And this was near the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So they had a feeling that this was some kind of a farewell speech that the Prophet ﷺ was telling them. Some final words that he was telling them and reminding them with. So they said to him, Oh Allah's Messenger, this sounds like the mawa'idha the, a reminder from a person who is saying farewell because when you are departing like when you are leaving your family on a trip or for a person who is about to die he says some very important words that he wants people to remember after him so they said it is like the mawa'idha of a person who is departing O oh Allah's messenger فَأَوْصِنَا so give us some advice Give us some wasiya, some commands, because wasiya means actually command. Command us what we should do. How we should act after you, if this is your final or one of your final words to us. And the Prophet's answer, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was indeed like the rest of his speech, like Allah Azza wa Jal described him as he وسلم, said in his hadith, Uti to Jawami al Kalim. I have been given the conciseness of speech, which means he could speak few words and they have great meanings. So that was the wasiyah also that he gave to his companions at that time. He said, First of all, the most important wasiyah that the Prophet ﷺ said very often in his commands and teachings to his companions and to the Ummah. The wasiyah that Allah gives to us all over his book. The best time for a person who's fasting to make dua is while breaking his fasting. There is nothing that draws you closer to Allah better than obligatory acts. I want to, to fast every single day of the year. This is not acceptable. In Ramadan, there is Laylatul Qadr, the night of destiny. So one night is equivalent to 1,000 months whatever you do in that night. Ramadan Fiqh Issues Muhammad, peace Pearls of Prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him Abu Huraira May Allah be pleased with him narrated that Allah's Messenger Peace be upon him said The signs of a hypocrite are three Whenever he speaks he tells a lie Whenever he promises, he always breaks it. If you trust him, he proves to be dishonest. Sahih al-Bukhari. 
یاسر فضا گا اسلام از نوٹ ون ہارزونٹل لائن ویئر ایوری تھنگ از ایکولی دا سیم دیٹ از ناٹ اسلام محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم واز دا گریٹسٹ لبریٹر دیٹ ہیومینٹی ہیز ایور نون دیٹ ہیومینٹی ول ایور نو وی آر دا بیسٹ امہ دیٹ واز ایریکٹڈ فار دی ویلفیئر آف مین کائنڈ ڈونٹ لیو ٹوڈے ایز اف دیز نو ٹمارو پاورٹی از نیور سیلیبریٹڈ ان اسلام As Muslims, self-pity does not exist. Watch your character, that becomes your destiny. Watch Yasir Fazaga in Here to Hereafter. The wasiya that if we understand it and live according to it, then all our affairs will be fixed, will be good. We can secure our place in Jannah if we only follow the first word that the Prophet ﷺ said in his advice. What was that word? Taqwa. Taqwa. Usikum bi taqwa Allah. So his first advice, taqwa Allah. And what is taqwa? Taqwa is to live according to Allah's commands, to abide by Allah's commands. Seeking by that Allah's rewards. And to stay away from disobedience, fearing Allah's punishment. That is taqwa. Taqwa means to try to protect yourself from something. Like the sun, for example. It is very sunny, and you try to put your hands or something, an umbrella or something, to shelter yourself from the rays of sun. Or there is great heat, you try to protect yourself with something. Great cold, you put a coat on yourself. Fire, you protect yourself from it. That's taqwa. Taqwa is to try to protect yourself from something that you fear. And for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we fear Him so much. We fear His punishment because we know that there is no punishment greater than His punishment. In this life and in the next life, of course, there is the eternal punishment. May Allah Azawajal protect us all from it. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu taught us in his dua, he used to say, وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْكَ O Allah, I seek protection from you, with you. From you, with you. If you are attacked by an enemy, you run away from that enemy to something else. You do not run away from the enemy to the same enemy. You do not run away from, the, from an attacking lion, for example, into the mouth of that lion or the jaws of that lion. But for Allah Azza wa Jal, and this doesn't apply to anyone else, you run, we run away from him to him. And that is why taqwa does not mean only that we shelter ourselves from Allah's anger and punishment, but it means also that we do what is needed to get Allah's, to deserve Allah's acceptance and rewards. That's why it has this combined meaning. And that is what all of our deen is about. Our deen is to do what Allah wants us to do and to avoid what He wants us to avoid. So isn't this what is the whole deen about? Is there anything else in the deen? That's it. Prophet ﷺ advised us, advised the ummah to Observe after him. The first thing that he said, Usikum bi taqwa Allah. Taqwa covers the whole deen, right? We just said this. 
But there are some important things that need to be highlighted or needed to be highlighted by the Prophet ﷺ so that people will not fall into problems after him. And they are part of taqwa, but as I said, they needed emphasis. So he said, وَالسَّمْعِ وَالطَّاعَةِ أُوصِيكُمْ بِتَقْوَى اللَّهِ وَالسَّمْعِ وَالطَّاعَةِ Sama wa ta'a means to listen and obey. Which means, if you are in a, in an Islamic community led by an Islamic leader or leadership, then do not be rebellious against your leadership. Because this will cause division and problems in the community. So instead of that, listen and obey. Listen and obey. Even if the one who takes charge over you is a slave, which means he was a slave and then he somehow took power. So don't fight with him for the power that he has because this will cause division. Some people will support him, others will be against him, and this will split your lines. And the Prophet ﷺ used the word ta'ammara. He did not use the word ummira, rather ta'ammara. Why? What's the difference? Ummira means he was given charge over you. And ta'ammara means that he took charge over you which means he fought for it. A good Muslim normally should not do fight for power. But still he fought for it and he won it. So don't fight with him over it. It's worthless. The important thing or the more important thing is to keep the word of the ummah together. So he is advising his companions that after me be careful. Don't fight for power. And this is part of the teachings of Islam. And then he told them, Indeed, those among you who will live after me, who will live long enough after me, they will find a great amount of disunity, dissension, among the Muslims, uh, the Muslim Ummah. You'll see great disunity. So gather together around your leader. And then in addition to that, he said, What else helps you or protects you against disunity and division and problems is alaykum bi sunnati follow my way adhere to my way and another hadith reported by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and others the Prophet sallallahu they tell us that the Prophet sallallahu once drew on the ground a line and he said this is Allah's way and then he drew out of this lines other short lines a straight line he said this is Allah's way then he drew short lines and he said Hadihi subul. these are other ways these are not Allah's way these are other ways at each intersection or at the beginning of each one of these short lines there is a devil calling people to it which means calling them away from the way of Allah now what will happen when people follow the other ways they will be separated from the main community the jama'ah 
And then the Prophet sallallahu said, recited, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ And indeed, this is my path. This is my way. Straight. It is straight. Follow it. And do not follow other ways. Those crooked ways. Because they will take you away from his way, from Allah's way. Allah's way is the sunnah of his prophet sallallahu Is the methodology that we are talking about in this lecture. So the prophet sallallahu said, Alaykum bi sunnati, adhere to my sunnah. Adhere to my way because my way is the straight way that will keep you together. Do not divert from it or split from it by listening to devils who want to pull you away from the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he said, وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ مِنْ بَعْدِ Now this is very important. This is a very important part of the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ that many people neglect. Most people neglect, in fact. He did not say, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ and stop here, no. He continued, وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِي And the way of the rightly guided successors or khulafa after me. So he's telling us Muslims to adhere to his way and another way, right? One way and the other way. What is the other way? The way of the rightly guided Khulafa. The Prophet's way goes one way and the way of the rightly guided Khulafa goes the other way, right? So they are the same way actually. So the Prophet ﷺ is emphasizing Sunnati wa sunnati al khulafa. My sunnah and the way, my way and the way of the rightly guided khulafa after me is the same way. Why did he mention them if it is the same way? Because the rightly guided khulafa, we're talking about Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, Omar, radiallahu an, Uthman, radiallahu an. Ali radiallahu anhu. Prophet sallallahu is telling us, follow my way and the way of my companions after me. And do not bring into it anything that is not part of it. Allah Azza is telling us here that we should never follow a way other than the way of the believers. O servants of Allah. You are Ovin Bukhari, Muslim, Sheikh Salim, the Prophet said, the Prophet said, these UAE. are his sayings. And Allah protected the Sunnah as He protected the Quran. The meaning from Allah and the phrasing from the Prophet. So the Sunnah is a revelation from Allah. equivalent to the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believing in Qadr means that we know that it is from Allah. Believing in Qadr means believing in Allah. And believing in Allah means believing in His Qadr. If we have the wrong belief in Qadr, then our belief in Allah is wrong. <laughs> Anything which contradicts the way of Rasulullah is wrong. Anything which contradicts the Quran of any of the other scriptures is wrong. The Quran is 100% the word of Allah. Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. Everything else was batil, it's clear, it is false, and we call to that truth. This is the truth.
Prophet Sallallahu is emphasizing Sunnati wa Sunnati al-Khulafa. My Sunnah and the way, my way and the way of the rightly guided Khulafa after me, it's the same way. Why did he mention them if it is the same way? Because the rightly guided Khulafa, we're talking about Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, Omar, radiallahu an, Uthman, radiallahu an, Ali, radiallahu an. Those rightly guided Khulafa after the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They ruled the Ummah for about, for a few decades, 30 or 40 years after the Prophet ﷺ. The question is, were they ruling independently? Like, let's say, Abu Bakr, when he made a decision, did he made it independently of everybody around him? No, he consulted the other companions and especially the more knowledgeable of them, like Omar and the ten. Who are the ten best of the companions? They are the ten who the Prophet ﷺ named as being in Jannah, of the people of Jannah. And this includes the four Khulafa plus six more. So Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he ruled with the help of the other companions. Later on, the Sahaba like Ibn Umar radiallahu an, or Ibn Mas'ud used to say to tell other people that you guys give fatwa so easily in matters that are so important that if they were presented to Umar radiallahu an, he would have brought together the people of Badr to consult with them. What does this mean? It means that when there is an important matter, Omar would consult with important people among the Sahaba, like those who fought in the battle of Badr. And we have many examples during the life of Omar radiallahu anhu. When he wanted to make a decision, he would consult. So I'm, what I'm saying here is that the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, the, the successors of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi the rightly successors, did not rule in vacuum but they ruled in a community and the community was formed from the sahaba so the prophet وسلم, is telling us follow my way and the way of my companions after me and why he added this word companions because the companions as a community lived with the prophet وسلم, and they learned from him and they saw how he practiced Islam. Some of them were in, with him in this battle, others in the other battle. One of them, some of them in this trip, others in that trip. Some of them in the masjid, others were not there then, and vice versa. So they covered all segments of his life, and they learned the details and the essence of his teachings. So when they agree on something, it is part of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah Azawajal tells us this in his book. He says, addressing the Sahaba, he says, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِهْتَدَوْا If they believe as you believe, O companions, then they are guided. So for us to have the correct belief, we should believe like the companions. We should learn what was their creed, their belief, and follow the same belief, or hold the same belief. And Allah Azawajal tells us, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِخِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعَ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى Whoever diverts from the way of the Prophet or displeases the Prophet by disobeying him, contents with the Prophet and follows a way other than the way of the believers. 
Who are the believers in this ayah? Who are the believers when the Quran was revealed? The Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Whoever follows away then the way of the believers, we give him what he chose. And we punish him in the hellfire, and this is indeed the worst of abodes, the worst residence. So Allah Azza wa is telling us here that we should never follow a way other than the way of the believers. So what the Prophet وسلم, is saying in the hadith of Al-Arbad is that is a confirmation of what is in the Quran. Follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided successors after me of my sahaba collectively after me. And not only that, not only follow it, he even used a stronger word to describe how are we supposed to follow this sunnah. He said, وَعَضُّ عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذ عَضُّ عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذ Like biting on something with your teeth, with your molar teeth. You know, so that you make sure that it doesn't slip from you. And then as a further confirmation or affirmation of what he said, he said, وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمَحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ And beware of the innovated matters in the religion. فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ Because indeed, every bid'ah, every innovation in the deen is a misguidance. So again, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that follow my sunnah and do not bring into it anything that is not part of it. Because if you bring into it something that is not part of it, you are committing an act of misguidance. In the hadith of Jabir radiallahu an, where the Prophet sallallahu said, وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا وَكُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ The same thing. The Prophet sallallahu used to repeat this in his speeches, in his khutbahs. Why was it so important for him to repeat it? So that it becomes inscribed in our hearts that anything that we do contrary to the sunnah leads to the hellfire. Every single innovated matter in the religion is a misguidance or that leads to the hellfire. And then you find people who tell you, we know that this is bid'ah, but this is a good bid'ah. This is a good bid'ah, so let us do it. What do you mean? The Prophet ﷺ did not know what he was saying when he said every single innovated matter is a bid'ah. You mean that Allah Azza wa Jal did not know what he said when he said, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. Today I have completed for you your religion. If our religion has been completed before the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. So how can there be people who come and say, I know it is complete, but I want to complete it more. How can you complete something that is already complete? By bringing some impurities, some bidas, some wrong or innovative matters to the deen, what will happen to the deen? Its, its beauty will be reduced. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ was so careful to emphasize it again and again and again. Beware of adding anything to my sunnah because my sunnah is complete and perfect. It is the deen that Allah chose for you and that I brought to you. So do not mar it, do not change it, do not alter it. So this hadith of Al-Arbad bin Sariya radiallahu anh,
tells us how to keep our ummah together, the Muslim ummah together. We say the ummah is divided. That's true. Why is it divided? Is it because they are far away in their, in their locations and their lands? No, they are divided even when they stand next to each other in prayer. You find them not willing to be close to their neighbors in the prayer. Why is that? Because the hearts are divided. And the Prophet ﷺ said to his companions, Ibadullah, let us sawunna sufufakum. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? The concept of jihad. Who are terrorists? Watch Dr. Zakir Naik, who marry more than one wife. They're labeled as terrorists, fundamentalists, who spread the religion with the sword. Misconceptions about Islam in Truth Exposed. Islam is still spreading because it is not the religion of paper. Islam is a way of life. Words of warning. On the day of judgment, every human being is vulnerable to be touched by hellfire. Abdullah Hakim Quick. Men have rights over women, but women also have rights over men. Mamdu Muhammad. We should remember what have we prepared for that day of judgment. Reminder, every Thursday at 11.30 p.m. UK and 12.30 a.m. Europe on Peace TV. The Prophet ﷺ said to his companions, Ibadullah, let us sawunna sufufakum, aw la yukhalifanna Allahu bayna wujuhikum, aw bayna qulubikum. Which means all servants of Allah. You either straighten your lines or Allah Azza wa Jal will make your hearts differ, your faces differ, your directions differ. So, why are we divided? Because of one important thing we are not all upon the Sunnah of the Prophet. Upon the manhaj of the Prophet وسلم, and his companions عنهم, that I described, that is mentioned in the hadith of Al Arbad bin Sariya. So I ask Allah جل, to guide us all to learning the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, so that we can follow it and to guide us all to knowing how to distinguish between the Sunnah and the Bid'ah, between what is right and what is wrong so that we avoid the bid'ah and we stay with the sunnah. By doing this, even with one thing at a time, we will find that the ummah will come slowly but surely closer and closer together as a united body, as Allah Azza wa Jal wants it to be al-mu'minun al-mu'mini kal-bunyan aw al-mathal al-mu'minina kajasadin wahid kaljasad al-wahid fi tawaddi wa tarahim wa ta'atufim the example of the believer is like one body. So may Allah Azza wa Jal bring us back together as one body under the banner of the true Sunnah of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. هذا وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. We have a question answer session. Uh, you are uh, requested to ask a question to Dr. Jibali. He will answer your questions, inshallah, on any issues of Islam. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To all of brothers and sisters here. My question, Sheikh Jibali, he mentioned in a speech as concerning to the good bid'ah, which I just discussed about, that Islam is a complete, this religion has been completed. So I asked him a question. What concerning those, the couple of fatwas which is given by the people, 
even Dr. Zakir Naik, one of his debate, he mentioned that in religion, innovation is permitted on the matters which has not been discussed. For example, maybe a photography or the kidney transplantation, where the Quran and the Hadith doesn't discuss about it. Or even, as Harun Yahya says in his book, that religion is a system which a person attains to have a structured lifestyle. So in our lifestyle, whatever in different things we come across, if the Quran and the Hadith doesn't speak about it, are we to take in, are we to follow it, or we should stick to the Quran and Sunnah? Thank you very much. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. In fact, the subject of bid'ah, or establishing the rules for distinguishing between sunnah and bid'ah, is a wide subject that is covered by the ulama in depth in their books. So it's not, I mean, a short time to answer such a question is not, which is a good question, uh, is not sufficient. But briefly, inshallah, I'll answer by saying that I was careful when I spoke, when I mentioned about bid'ah, to say it is bid'ah in the deen. And that to distinguish the deen from worldly affairs, from the dunya. There are matters that relate to our faith and to our acts of worship. And that is what we mean when we say our deen. That is our beliefs and the way that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are supposed to believe exactly as Allah taught us and revealed in his book or upon the tongue of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In addition to this, any act, all, all our acts of worship should be the way that Allah taught us to worship him, to please him. So if we try to please him in a way different from what he taught us, this is considered a bid'ah or an innovation in the practice, a practical innovation you can call it. Now of course, any practical innovation has to be based on some kind of conviction or belief. And that is why practical bid'ahs are linked to belief bid'ah in the aqidah or in the creed. As an example of practical bid'ah or bid'ah and worship, the Prophet ﷺ once saw a man standing in the sun and he asked, why is this man standing in the sun? And his close companions told him that this man is called so-and-so Abu Israel or something and he has made a vow. His vow was that he will stand in the sun and will fast and will not speak to anyone. So he made a commitment, a vow that he will do four acts of worship. Being, remaining silent, avoiding eating, fasting, so avoiding speaking, avoiding eating, avoiding sitting, and avoiding, what was the fourth thing? Shade, avoiding sitting in the shade. So what was the answer of the Prophet ﷺ? He said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌ عَنْ هَذَا أَنْ يُعَذِّبَ نَفْسَهُ Allah is in no need for this person to, to torture himself. And I said, command him to sit in the shade and to speak, but let him complete his fasting. So this hadith tells us that worship is not torture, Worship is certain acts that Allah Azza wa Jal knows that they benefit us and that is why He commanded us to do. And we cannot do them as our desires yani, dictate to us. They have to be according to what Allah Azza wa Jal told us or taught us. Another important example that you probably also heard is the example of the three people who came to the Prophet ﷺ, to the Prophet's houses. And they asked, or the, a number of people, and asked the wives of the Prophet, 
how he worships Allah Azza wa Jal. And they told him what he does. And they said, this is not much. We can do much more. But maybe he is not doing much because Allah has already forgave him. So they decided to do different things. One of them said, I will stay all night up praying. And the other one said, I will fast every single day of my life. And the third one said, I will never approach women. I will not marry at all. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard about this, he became very angry. Why? Because their actions or the actions they decided to do is based on a very serious deviation in aqidah and belief. What is the serious deviation? They believe they can improve over the Prophet ﷺ. And they believe that they can bring new acts of worship into Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ said, أَمَا إِنِّي لَأَخْشَاكُمْ لِلَّهِ وَأَتْقَاكُمْ لَا Verily, he gave a khutbah, and he said, Indeed, I am the one who fears Allah and have taqwa of Him more than any of you. And yet, I sleep and I get up for prayer at night. I fast some days and break my fast the other days, and I marry women. So whoever dislikes my sunnah is not part of my followers. So this tells us that it's not up to us to decide how we want to worship Allah. We have to worship Allah according to the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us. As for other acts, other actions, our other deeds in our daily life, if they are not under these two headings, which means something relating to aqidah, to creed, to belief, and something not relating to acts of worship, then we have much more freedom to deal with them. If they do not yeah, and relate to worship, then it's, it's open, which means we, we, ch we check and look at the maslaha, the benefit of the Muslims. My benefit or the benefit of my, my family, my community, if they are for, of benefit, we, I do them. Otherwise, I don't do them. But they are not acts of worship. We say that in general, to make it simple, if it is a matter of ibadah or a matter of aqidah or belief, then we cannot change it or add to it. Jazakallah. Yeah, for sure. This is to Sheikh Jibali. Uh, during uh, Banu Abbas period, uh, most of the scientists who developed physics, chemistry, and biology and all, they were motors lights. Why we don't find uh, Motazila and Asharia? Uh, we don't find examples of uh, Ahl Sunnatul al Jama, when uh, scientists working on material science. Of course, religious uh, knowledge is different, fiqh and all, there were people. But uh, on material science, don't find examples, maybe rare, but Al Kandi, Farabi, Abyssina, all these were Motazilites. Can you give me examples and the reason for it? Uh, I was in science, I have a PhD in physics, and I am from Ahl Sunnah. And, uh, yeah, I know, I mean, it doesn't matter, I mean, which period we are talking about. And the people, it happened maybe for Allah Azza wa wanted to try the Ummah by that. Some of the people who became brilliant in science happened to be deviant in their beliefs. Or they had some deviation in their beliefs. But that doesn't mean that this is the rule always. I'm saying that, I'm giving myself as an example to tell you that there is no contradiction between being upon the correct belief of sunnah and being a scientist you know to, to this moment i love science and whenever i i have chance like the other day i was watching the tv here the indian tv and i found that they have a channel about physics explaining physics and qu quantum mechanics and things like that i was so happy and i was i started watching it so i'm saying there's no conflict between the two and Islam supports science, and science supports Islam. So there is no contradiction. In religion, innovation is permitted on the matters which has not been discussed. For example, maybe a photography or the kidney transplantation, but the Quran and the Hadith doesn't discuss about it. Scientists working on material science, of course, religious knowledge is different. Fiqh and all, there were people. The will of Allah supersedes the will of us, 
are the will, uh, will of uh, Allah is only the will of us. There are many points or many ways to answer it. Allahu Akbar, Allah. That all Muslims believe in the one and same Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All Muslims believe in the final and same messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Quran, it is the last revelation of Allah. Allah himself said, right, I'll take care of preserving it myself. I would not entrust it to anyone. Dr. Jamal Badabi. A day when no wealth or children would be of any help except those who come to Allah with a clean heart. Because after all, we came from the dust and to dust we are returning. Muslim living in any part of the world, he is our brother. We should feel for him. Muslims are suffering. Muslims are butchered. Muslims are slain. And some of us even, they don't feel, they don't cry over that. Salim Al-Amri. If one organ is in pain, the whole body feels that. Whether he's in India, whether he's in Far East, whether he's wherever the Muslim is, he is my brother. I should feel for him. Yeah. Brother, Assalamu alaikum. This is to Sheikh Jibali. Uh, during the uh, Banu Abbas period, uh, most of the scientists who developed physics, chemistry, and biology and all, they were Motozilites. Why were you don't find uh, Motozila and Asharia? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't find examples of uh, Ahl Sunnatul Jama. I mean, uh, s a scientists working on material science, of course, religious uh, knowledge is different. Fiqh and all, they were people. But uh, on material science, don't find examples, maybe rare, but al Kandi, Farabi, Ab uh, Abyssina, all these were uh, Motozilites. Can you give me examples and the reason for it? Uh, I was in science, I have a PhD in physics, and I am from Ahl Sunnah. And. Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, which period we are talking about. And the people, it happened maybe for Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to try the Ummah by that. Some of the people who became brilliant in science happened to be deviant in their beliefs. Or they had some deviation in their beliefs. But that doesn't mean that this is the rule always. I'm saying that, I'm giving myself as an example to tell you that there is no contradiction between being upon the correct belief of Sunnah and being a scientist. You know, to, to this moment, I love science. And whenever I, I have chance, like the other day, I was watching the TV here, the Indian TV, and I found that they have a channel about physics, explaining physics and qu quantum mechanics and things like that. I was so happy and I, was, I started watching it. So I'm saying there is no conflict between the two. And Islam supports science, and science supports Islam. So there is no contradiction. The question is regarding Rukya, spiritual healing. In Bukhari, volume 7, uh, Hadith 600, in 605, I suppose, it's given that people who will enter Jannah without reckoning and without torment will be those who do not treat themselves with Rukya. And it is also given in another hadith in Muslim, in Book of Iman, chapter 68, hadith 101. Sister, the correct wording of the hadith, the authentic wording, there are some weak reports uh, or wordings of this hadith, which say about the 70,000 who entered Jannah without hisab or adab, without reckoning or punishment are those who la yarquna wa la yastarquna. They do not give ruqya and they do not seek it. But the correct wording is that they do not seek ruqya. There is no word yarqun, only yastarqun. Those who do not seek ruqya from others. And this does not say that it is prohibited to seek ruqya. It just says that if you are of the type of persons who cannot be directly relying on Allah Azza wa Jal, so that you do not need anybody else's help to make ruqya, to make dua for yourself to be cured, but you need somebody else to do it for you, 
then you are not as strong as those 70,000 people who deserve to enter Jannah so quickly. So it is telling of about a, a higher group of Muslims, may Allah Azawajal make us of them, who have very strong link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and very strong tawakkul, reliance on Him. Those people, they only seek help from Him directly without having other people come and read on them and help them with that. So those people enter without hisab or adab. As for the others, it's not prohibited. It's permissible, but they are not as good as the others. So seeking, doing ruqya for yourself or others, there's nothing wrong with it. Rather, it is something good that, uh, as you heard, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to do it and the Prophet ﷺ himself used to do it for himself and for his grandchildren and for other people. Wallahu alam. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is regarding Qadr. Uh, how I can respond to an atheist uh, that if he's saying that uh, Allah cannot be simultaneously omnipotent and omniscient, that is, uh, if he's able to do all things, he ceased to, uh, he had not planned well. Uh, okay. Allah Azza wa Jal, with his full knowledge of things, of the details of everything, he knows what will happen in his creation until the end of time. And he knows the means that will lead to the ends. And he knows whether the means will be fulfilled or not. So he knows, I gave an example yesterday of, for instance, a person being kind to his parents. He knows that person A, for example, will be kind to his parents, so he will live longer than person B, who will be similar to a person A in everything, except that person A was good to his parents, person B was not good to his parents. So there will be difference in lifespan between the two persons. He knows that a certain person Two people in the same situation, the same condition, one of them will make a supplication, dua, and Allah will answer it and will save this person from a certain distress. And the other person, B, will not make the supplication, so he will not be saved. So Allah's knowledge is so complete. I mean, like for us, if I'm a scientist, I make an experiment and I predict some of the results of the experiment, right? So I know that if I put A with B, the, the result will be C. But sometimes something goes wrong and there's one condition that I forgot to control. The, te the room temperature, the pressure, the, you know, there are many things that could happen and I did not control them. I did not expect this to happen. You know, the, the scientists who send out the shuttles, the space shuttles, they study everything, they put everything on, on computer, and they think that the result will come out exactly as they planned. But some little glitch in their planning, some little condition may mess up all their result. But for Allah Azawajal, this does not apply. It's not he, that he's experimenting, it is that he, he knows exactly. So he knows and he puts this A with B with C with D, etc. And you know the outcome will be this. And then from this, there will be this other outcome and so on. So all of this is planned. So I don't see how could there be contradiction between his knowledge and the results that will happen. And that these results will be planned by him and will appear to have changed. But actually, they are not different from what he has already recorded in the preserved slate or in Lawh al-Mahfuz. Brother. The will of Allah supersedes the will of us, or the will, uh, will of uh, Allah is only the will of us. Or He has given different wills. You can choose. If it is already written, which will we are going to choose, Allah knew before itself. Then why He has given give two wills? If there is, if He has given a chance to choose your wills. Okay, the. Uh... The will of Allah indeed encompasses all our wills because He says, You do not will, but 
as Allah wills, or if Allah wills what you will. And we say this all, of, all the time. When we want to do something, we say, inshallah, we will do this, we will do that. Now, the answer to this, I mean, there's, there are many points or many ways to answer it. And like I said, you know, in my book, I have detailed like five or six answers to this question. Some of them from our practical life. When we say, I, I want to eat, for example, inshallah. I want to eat dinner now, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, this means that I will take some action to eat. And I know this from myself. I know that I have the ability to go and take action and have the will, implement my will to eat. But at the same time, I know that Allah's will encompasses this, which means if Allah decides that I will die right now, I'm not going to eat. Or if He decides that this question and answer session will extend until after midnight, then I will not eat too. So, so there will be situations where, so Allah's will definitely will prevail. But Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that He gave us the choice and that He has, He is not enforcing us to do good or, uh, or, or evil. So this is something that we know from His promises from his book and we know from our everyday life we know from you know even not from religious aspects from daily aspects as i give the example of eating so so with this we cannot claim that if we do something wrong it is allah azawajal who forced us to do it allah azawajal created our will for us to act and he created our ability to act Right? Our will is created by Allah Azawajal. And our ability is Allah's creation because everything in this world is Allah's creation. Now, if we use this will and ability, the will that we have and the ability that we have to act, then the action will take place. So if we have the will to do wrong and the ability to do it, we'll do wrong. Now Allah Azawajal gave us the two choices of doing good or wrong and it's then up to us to choose whether we uh, we do the good or the wrong and it is not that we are not enforced by Allah Azawajal in this inna salata tanha anil fasha evil munkar the salah is the most important pillar of Islam after Iman, after faith. Indeed, successful are the believers, those who pray with humility and attentiveness. You have no excuse for missing your salah. If you can't stand, pray while sitting. If you can't sit, pray while lying on your sides. You can even pray with ishara, with just indication. But offering salah is compulsory. There's no excuse for you to miss your salah. Salah, the programming towards righteousness. Dr. Zakir Naik speaks on Salah, the programming towards righteousness in Truth Exposed. The Prophet وسلم, preached La ilaha illallah. And many are the miracles that he has been given. Really, we can talk hours and hours about the number of miracles. They don't number in the hundreds, they number in the thousands. But his greatest miracle was the miracle of the Qur'an. Whoever used to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, then Allah is Al-Hay, the ever-living, who never dies. Fundamentals of Faith Muhammad, peace Pearls of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, by Allah, he does not believe. By Allah, he does not believe. By Allah, he does not believe. He was asked, Who, O Messenger of Allah? He said, One whose neighbor is not safe from his mischief. Sahih al Bukhari, Volume 8, Kitabul Adab, Book of Manners, Chapter 29, Hadith Number. 6016
डॉक्टर जाकिर नाइक डियर ब्रदर एंड सिस्टर्स अस्सलाम वालेकुम डूइंग दावा दैट इज कन्वेइंग द मिस्ट्री ऑफ इस्लाम इन माय ड्यूटी योर ड्यूटी एंड एवरी मुस्लिम ड्यूटी पीस टीवी ऑफर्स यू एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू इन्वेस्ट इन डूइंग दावा वर्ल्ड वाइड एवरी डॉलर दैट यू कंट्रीब्यूट count in reaching out to more and more people worldwide with the message of Islam through Peace TV Islamic program support Peace TV send your donation in zakat to IRFI Islamic Bank of Britain 394 Coventry Road Small Heath Birmingham UK B100UF pound account number 0113230 euro account 0113230 US dollar account 0113230 sort code 300083 swift bic code ibo bgb22 iban gb52 lo yd 30963401024192 Please confirm your contribution at support at peace tv dot org. Invest, peace of Allah, in the peace tv growth. We cannot claim that if we do something wrong, it is Allah Azza wa Jal who forced us to do it. Allah Azza wa Jal created our will for us to act. and he created our ability to act right our will is created by allah azza wa jalla and our ability is allah's creation because everything in this world is allah's creation now if we use this will and ability the will that we have and the ability that we have to act then the action will take place so if we have the will to do wrong and the ability to do it we'll do wrong Now Allah Azza wa Jalla gave us the two choices of doing good or wrong and it's then up to us to choose whether we uh, we do the good or the wrong and it is not that we are not enforced by Allah Azza wa Jalla in this. I don't know I mean I probably answered some of the question but you probably have some more doubts in your mind that you want to to ask so that I can elaborate more. Allah has given uh, a person the choice to take the right path and the wrong path. Right. You answer yes. Do you are you going to answer yes? To ha- we have the choice. Yeah, we do have the choice. You, if you have the choice, mm. that means that you t- make the decision to go in the right path or wrong path. That means your will supersedes the will of Allah, because He has given both the choices to you, isn't it? Then where is the question of it is pre-written? If it is pre-written, then it is the will of Allah supersedes your will. So there is a catch between these two things. Do yeah. You understand, right? I see your yeah. point. Okay, this is the difference, really, between two major groups of people who deviated in their beliefs from the correct path, and these are called the Qadariya and the Jabriya. The Qadariya say that since we have the choice to do what whatever we want to do that means that allah has no hand in it he has no say in it and some of them go to the extent of saying that he doesn't even know beforehand what we are going to do okay these are the qadariya and this is a deviant group from islam why because what they say amounts to saying that allah does not create our actions because he doesn't know what them and he does not have a control over them therefore he is not their creator so it amounts to saying that our actions are have another creator so this is they commit shirk without knowing it or with knowing it these are the qadariya on the other hand the jabriya say something else they say since allah knows what we are going to do therefore he is forcing us to do it since he creates our will therefore he is forcing us to act bad or act good whatever and we have no control of, over whether we are sinful or, or good these are the jabriya and the people of sunna are in the middle between the two paths we say allah azza wa jal knows all what we are going to do 
and he created our will and ability for what we want to do. But at the same time, he ha gave us the choice. And he knows about this choice that we are going to take. Some people, some ulama, to bring the picture closer to the minds, give you the example of a person like a principal, for example, in a school. They say a principal in a school, uh, a, an experienced principal who has been in the school for many years and he knows the students and their attitudes and their uh, inclinations and so on, maybe on the first day of the year, he will look at the students, maybe he will ask them a couple of questions, and then he will say, at the end of the year, you will fail. And at the end of the year, you will be among the best students, and so on. Or maybe he will say, put this in his mind, but he will not tell them. And at the end of the year, the result will come exactly as he predicted in the beginning of the year. Can we say that the principle force the students to fail or to succeed? We cannot. We say that by his great knowledge, he knew ahead of time what they are going to do. Now Allah's knowledge, of course, is nothing comparable to the human knowledge. He has perfect knowledge, and he knows exactly what we will do at the end of our time. Okay, question from sisters. I used to be a good, totally submitting Muslim but of late, I've been having grave doubts whether Allah exists about the Prophet, etc. Now, I don't know whether I'm a Muslim or a Kafir, but I must be a Munafiq, right? I'm afraid I might dig in this, I must die in this state. Astaghfirullah, please help me. What should I do? I still continue to pray and do other ibadat. This is a sad situation, of course. And usually when this happens, it means that a person has been exposed to a lot of wrong propaganda. And personally, I tell you about myself that I got into somewhat similar state, not the same, not that level. But I started having some doubts. And where did the doubts come from? When I was young, in my late teens or early 20s, I don't remember now, because it's like 100 years ago, my friends took me to, we used to have in our city, Beirut, uh, the uh, Soviet cultural center. And my friends took me there, said, let's go there. They have so many good books, and they have free books, and they have, you can play chess, and I was a very good chess player, so I like to play chess, and so on. So we went there to play chess, and I got some books. And one of the books was about the life of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. It was a small book in English. When I read it, I, I had almost doubts about almost the whole biography of the Prophet ﷺ, about the person of the Prophet ﷺ himself. But they were not like, you know, full extreme doubts. It became like small doubts. Because they tell you some truth, and they bring some falsehood with it. Like when the Prophet ﷺ used to, re to have revelation, wahi, they say he used to have, what they call it, epilepsy or something like that. And, you know, they take different distinct events from his life and they change their, their meanings and they bring some weak reports and they tell you this is also in the books of Muslims and therefore this is what it is. Now when I read that book, I became somewhat doubtful. And this state of doubt made me feel miserable at heart. As you can tell from the letter of this person was a sister or brother who wrote this so i felt a little misery in my heart because you know i was so pleased with with my strong iman and now i have some doubts about it because if you doubt the truth of the message of the prophet sallallahu you you doubt all of islam then subhanallah it happened that almost about a week later 
a relative of mine gave me a book. He said, I don't want this book. I want to throw it away. Or if you want to take it, go ahead and take it. It was a book of seerah of the Prophet ﷺ by Muhammad Hussein Haikal. And even though the book itself has big mistakes, weak narrations and things like that. But, and I think the person is Mu'tazili somewhat in his approach, but he had an introduction which refuted the exact points that I read in that, in that book. When I read it, I was so happy. I was so calmed at heart. And I felt, alhamdulillah, now I know that, you know, those people have, have brought so many worthless doubts and Allah clarified them for me. So really, when you find yourself doubtful, go to the company of those who will reassure you. Because as the Prophet ﷺ told us, that shaitan will come to us and bring doubts into our hearts. He will ask you, as the Prophet ﷺ said, who created this and who made this and who made this, until he asks you, who made Allah? So he said, whoever finds this in his heart, let him say, seek refuge with Allah from these whispers of Satan. So the best thing to do is be in the company of the good people and read the good books because they are the book of Allah Azawajal and books that derive from the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet When you read them, you find a lot of serenity in your heart. When we are away from them, we become weak. This is normal. This is very normal. Stay away from the book of Allah for a few days and you find that your heart becomes dry. Pray your prayers in a ritual manner without thinking about them. You find your heart became hard. Commit a few sins. You find that you put a barrier between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when we come back to Allah, just read a few hadith. Take a book of hadith of the Prophet sallallahu and read some of the hadith in it. You find subhanAllah such a strong meanings and language. You think... MashaAllah, this is all said by the Prophet Sallallahu and I was so ignorant about it or so forgetful about it. Read some of the ayat of the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Read Surah Al-An'am from beginning to end and see how Allah Azza wa answers one doubt after the other for the mushrikeen in this great surah. So really in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu is a cure for all of our doubts. And if we had, cannot understand them, then let's go to the people who can help us understand them and stay in the company of the believers. But stay in good company and Allah will cure you from this great problem.